Um, so we'll do that tonight at six and then Wednesday at six as well. Um, I always do so much planning and I did this about 10 minutes ago. So uh, we're gonna try to have a sunrise service at this is where I'm going to get a whipping from my wife at uh, 6.30 next Sunday morning. So uh, that will be about the, about the time the sun comes up. So we'll need just for a few minutes, 30th most, unless the Lord um, really lays something on me after I get here. But uh, anyway, we'll be just for about 30 minutes or so and maybe have a uh, coffee and something afterwards. Um, a, uh, a continental breakfast, we'll say. <laughs> so uh, come and we'll, we'll have that uh, afterwards and then we'll have our regular service in the morning and then not meet next Sunday night. So uh, let's try that. What? And that's all depending on. Yes. Um, we have an arrival set for next Sunday morning, so we'll see how that uh, turns out. Uh, but we'll let you know during the week if that how that comes along. All right. Any other announcement? All right. Well, if you will, stand and everybody go to that side and read it.
making your way back to your seat. Turn to number 175. We'll sing all five verses.
does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And if I could throw the first part of verse 8 in, love never fails. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for this time, and we pray that you would help us to understand a little better about this thing that Paul calls love, this self-sacrificing, self-giving, seeking the best for others, love that you have for us and that we're to have for each other. Help us, Lord, now. May your spirit teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. The part that will give you a little relief, there are 15 descriptions, explanations of love in these four verses. And we're not going to look at all 15 today. That's the part that you'll like. We're just going to look at the first four or five. Um, as we think about love, when we try to describe something, and I don't, I'm not in a position to give you an English or a vocabulary language um, lesson, but when we try to describe something, we describe it with adjectives. We describe, we try to describe what it is. The interesting thing about this. When Paul is giving us an explanation of love, he doesn't try to describe what it is. He describes what it does. These are 15 verbs that Paul uses to tell us what love is. And we can see what love is by what love does. Or I think there's, there's seven that are positive and eight are negative, or maybe it's the other way around. But anyway... Not only what love does, but more importantly, what love doesn't do. And we're going to look at these today. John says in his epistle, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. The greatest explanation that we can give for love is Jesus. If we look at his life, if we look at the way he lived, he is the personification of love in action. One commentator suggested that where the Bible says charity or love, you could substitute the name of Christ. And so I made a little list here, see if you agree. Jesus is long-suffering and is kind. Jesus is not envious. Jesus doesn't brag. Jesus is not puffed up. He's, we just sang, a man of sorrows. Jesus does not behave rudely. Jesus does not seek his own. He came to do the Father's will. Jesus is not provoked. Jesus thinks no evil. Jesus does not rejoice in iniquity. Jesus rejoices in the truth. Jesus bears all things. Jesus believes all things. Jesus hopes all things. Jesus endures all things. Jesus never fails. He is love, and he is our supreme example, I think, of love. First, love is patient. The King James says love suffers long, and that's really what it means to Really, it means to be long-tempered, to not uh, come apart when everybody else is. It's able to endure and to suffer. Peter uses this word to describe God. The people in Peter's day said, things are no different than they've always been. Ever since the creation of the world, everything's been like it is. And Peter says that's not true. Things have been different. There was a flood. There was the fall. And one day Christ will come back. And it's not because God doesn't keep his promise. But it's because 
He is long suffering to us. He suffers long. And that's the way God is. This word for long suffering or patience is used in the Bible to be pointed toward people and not toward circumstances. It's not that you would be long suffering toward a circumstance, but you would be long suffering toward a person. And sometimes that's harder, especially if you drive on 280 any length of time. Chrysostom, Chrysostom, an early church father, said this. This is the word for long-suffering. It's a word which is used of a man who is wronged and who has it easily in his power to avenge himself but will never do it. Patience never retaliates. And that's hard in the world that we live in, in any world that we live in. And we like it. We like getting even. If you're like me, hopefully not too much like me, but, and I've thought of this before, have you ever seen a Clint Eastwood movie? Now this is, I'm not going to kick you out of church if you like Clint Eastwood, but um, most of us have. But most all Clint Eastwood movies have the same storyline. I mean, sometimes they're in the Old West, sometimes they're in San Francisco. But it's somebody did something to him at the first of the movie, and then the whole rest of the movie, we're waiting, we're waiting, and Clint's going to get them back at the end. And we're waiting on that. We love it. Hey, somebody's been wronged, and they're going to get paid back. That's not what love is. Love doesn't pay back. It's able to retaliate, as Chrysostom said, but it doesn't. Paul warns us, don't pay back. Recompense no man evil for evil but provide things honest in the sight of the Lord. Too many of us, and I don't want to, I'm using a lot of movie illustrations, maybe you won't keep me out of the church, uh, but this movie, I don't know how well it agrees with the book, but the Count of Monte Cristo, he was wronged and he was thrown into jail and he manages to escape from the dungeon and find the treasure that the guy told him and he's gonna get even with everybody. And he does. And this is the part that's crazy to me in the movie. He gets even with everybody and kills his enemy and he's got even with everybody and then he says, now I'm not going to get even with anybody anymore. Well, of course not. You've already got even with everybody. <laughs> but too often, we want to do that. Now that I've evened the score, I'm not going to get even anymore. And that is not love. Love suffers long. As Stephen, who was a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost, and he preached one of the greatest messages ever. He gives the history of Israel in Acts chapter 7. And he, he's he got the crowd with him. He's telling about how God called Abraham and blessed him and did all this and led him out of Egypt. On and on and on and on. And he gets to about verse 51 and they go from amen to oh me. But you rejected Christ. You always resist the Holy Spirit. And they drug him out of town outside the city walls. And they picked up rocks and stoned him. And just before he died, the Bible says he looked up and could see this is the only time we see Jesus standing. The rest of the time he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And he prayed, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Love suffers long. 
Secondly, love is kind. We get the two of the positive ones first. Love is kind. John MacArthur says in his commentary, it not only feels generous, it is generous. It not only desires others' welfare, it works for it. Love seeks what's best for somebody else. It's kind. Jesus told his disciples, basically, and we don't like this, it's better for you to be taken advantage of than for you to seek your own way. Jesus said, if any man will sue thee at the law to take away thy coat, let him have your cloak also, and whoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. At that time, the Roman soldiers could force the Jewish people to carry their pack, but they could only force them for a mile. And Jesus said, if they force you to do it a mile, go, we would say, the second mile. Love is kind. And again, we're to be kind because God is kind. Paul tells Titus, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It's only because of the kindness of God that we can come to him. He showed his kindness by not giving us what we deserved. Jesus said, love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and you shall be called children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.32, if you memorize in verses, this is a good one to learn. Well, if I can give you just a little example, illustration of what kindness is. David had been anointed king, and even though he had been anointed king, Saul tried to kill him. Jonathan, his son, was next in line to be king, but he was not king. He knew David would be king, but Saul was trying to kill David. And he couldn't get to the throne because of Saul. And he had opportunities to get rid of Saul, and he wouldn't do it. He was waiting on God's timing. And finally, it was God's timing. And Saul and Jonathan were both killed in battle, and now David's king. And there's some things going on, and some of David's people are killing some of Saul's people, and that sort of thing. And David says in 2 Samuel chapter 9, is there anybody left of Jonathan's house? Now that's us. We're thinking, all right, David's fixing a clean house. He's fixing to get rid of everybody. But David says, is there anybody left in Jonathan's or Saul's house that I can show kindness toward because of Jonathan? Paul says it this way, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, not because they deserve it, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We're to be kind and forgiving to others, not because they deserve it, but because of what God has done for us. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious. Love is not jealous. It envieth not. There are really two kinds of envy or jealousy that we see in the world today, or at least two, uh, maybe more than that. One is, I'm envious of something that you have. The job you have, the car you have, the house you have, the family you have, the wife you have. I want something that you've got. And that's one kind of envy, and that's bad. God took care of that in the, 
as my dentist says on the in the top ten list. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's slave, your neighbor's animals, or anything that your neighbor has. That's bad that we would be envious or that we would be covetous. But the second kind of envy is not that I want I want what you got. It's I don't want you to even have what you got. I don't, not that I want it, I don't want you to have it. There was two women that came to Solomon and both had a baby, but there was only one baby now. They had rolled over in the bed and killed one of the children. They came to Solomon and said, this, it's my baby, the one that's alive is mine. Kind of like the man that had the cows that he was going to give one to God. He didn't name them, and one of them died, and he came in and said, God's cow died this morning. Um, but it was the other one's baby that had died. And they brought her to Solomon, and Solomon said, oh, okay, well, bring me a sword, and I'll cut the baby in half, and you can both have half. Well, the one that wasn't a mother said, yeah, that'll be good. Do you see? She not only wanted what the other woman had, she didn't want her habit. And that is envious. And that's not love. Eve was envious of what she didn't have in the garden and sinned. Cain was envious of the um, commendation, the blessing that his brother Abel got and he killed him. Joseph's brothers were envious of him and sold him into slavery. Daniel was thrown into a den of lions because of jealousy of the other wise men. The writer of Proverbs says, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? And James says, For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. So, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, love doesn't brag, it doesn't boast. The King James says it vaunteth not itself. That sounds bad, doesn't it? To brag, to be prideful, somebody has said pride is the only disease that makes everyone sick except the person that has it. Somebody that just goes on and on and on and on and on about themselves. If you remember the episode of Andy Griffith where they take Ernest T. to the uh, Miss Wiley's house. My Fair Ernest T. is the name of it after sort of the same storyline as the play My Fair Lady. But they get him there and he meets Romina, his girlfriend, and she's just learning the social graces too and all she wants to talk about is the weather. And Ernest T. says, ma'am, do we have to keep talking about the weather? Let's talk about me. You want to know what's going on with me? You want to talk about me? And too often, that's what we see even in ourselves. It's amazing sometimes how we can see and hear other people bragging, but we don't hear it in ourselves. It's like greed. Milton Friedman said, uh, it's only the other person that's greedy, it's not us. It's only other people that brag, not us. But to love doesn't boast. But that's what the Corinthians were doing. They bragged about which preacher they liked the best, about which gift they had. They boasted even maybe about who they had taken to court and how much farther up the ladder they were than others. Blaise Pascal, a French philosopher, said, if you want people to think well of you, do not speak well of yourself. If you want people to think well of you, do not speak well of yourself. And that great theologian, Dr. Seuss, wrote these words. 
I saw on this hill, since my neighbor's eyesight was so keen, the two biggest fools that I've ever seen. And the fools that I saw were none other than you, who seem to have nothing else better to do than to sit here and argue who's better than who. To brag and to boast is not loving. And again, our example is Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, Love doesn't brag, and love is not puffed up. William Barclay says in his commentary, love isn't inflated with its own importance. Paul had already warned the, the Corinthians about being puffed up. The, the action of this is bragging, and the attitude is arrogance. Paul says, I wrote to you, I told you about Apollos and me so you wouldn't think more highly of people than you ought to. That no one of you would be puffed up one against another. And Paul's argument is, what do you have that you didn't receive? And if everything you have you received, why do you act like you did something to get it? Why do you act like you didn't receive it? William Carey was really the founder of the Baptist missions in India. And as he went to the field, he started out as a, a cobbler, a person who repaired shoes. And he went to the mission field. He was a brilliant linguist. And he was responsible for translating the Bible into at least 34 different languages and dialects. He was raised in a simple home in England. And in his early career, he worked as a cobbler. When he was in India, he was often ridiculed about his humble beginnings. And at a dinner, one particular snob said to William Carey. I understand that you work, once worked as a shoemaker. Oh no, your lordship, Carey replied. I was not a shoemaker, only a cobbler. In other words, I didn't make the shoes, I just fixed them. Love is not arrogant. It's not puffed up like John the Baptist if we were well and some of John the Baptist disciples did John the Baptist was out in the wilderness preaching out in the desert there in the Jordan River I like to picture him standing in the river waiting for somebody to come out and be baptized as he preached and the Bible says Everybody went out to see John preach. Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan came out to him. John had a great ministry. And if we would say he was the man, they were all coming to hear him. But one day as Jesus stood in the crowd, John said, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who is coming after me is preferred before me whose shoe latchet I'm not worthy to unloose. John's disciples came to him and said, hey, this fellow Jesus is baptizing more people than you are. Don't we need to do something? Don't we need to get, need to get out more pamphlets or advertise a little better? John said, no, he must increase and I must decrease. 
writer of Proverbs says it this way, only by pride cometh contention. Pride, arrogance, and boasting is not love. John MacArthur says again, arrogance is big-headed and love is big-hearted. So, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious. Love doesn't boast. Love is not puffed up. As we stated earlier, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is long-suffering, is kind, is not envious, doesn't brag, and is not puffed up. If anybody ever had an opportunity or could legitimately be puffed up, it was Jesus. I mean, he's the Son of God incarnate. And yet, what did we say? Man of sorrows, is what Isaiah 53 says. We esteemed him stricken and smitten of God. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And Philip Bliss writes, he wrote a lot of songs in our hymn book, Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah! What a Savior! Can you see how much He loves us? And that's the way that we are to love. That's love explained. Do you love? Do you love Jesus who loved us so much that he was willing to die for us? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Lord, we are grateful that you love us. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand as much as we can this tremendous love that you have for us that is patient and kind and doesn't boast. It's not arrogant. It's not puffed up. It's not envious. Lord, we pray that you would help us or that you would love others through us in this way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a decision that you need to make, would you come as we stand and sing? Number three, ten.